morning, I would have been like, what you talking about? You're crazy. <laughs> but I'm here, and I'm so excited. And Philip got to come. He's my ride or die. And, well, I'm not going to say that. He got to come. And I'm excited about that, that uh, he's with me. And, you know, there's a lot of stories that never get told. There's just, there's, there's no way to tell it all in a setting like this. And let's see what time it is. Um, Daryl told, told you guys that I wouldn't take an hour. Yeah. One o'clock lunch. <laughs> I'll, I'll really try to hurry. But um, I didn't have this in my notes. This story, this, this little piece needs to be told. So when this building was being built, the trusses were delivered, the, the rafters. And Daddy was here to set them. Daddy is Gordon Easley. I'm his daughter. My sister Donnie is here. And Pally and Daryl Pastor. Rachel, go to the mic. You can't hear. You can't hear? Okay. Um, okay. So Daddy was here to set the trusses for the building, to put the roof on. Because my parents lived by no debt. And the sheer grit of faith and trust and absolute obedience, all undergirded with prayer. They modeled that. So here Daddy was. Now, this detail I'm not exactly sure of. Jack Allen may have been here to help Daddy. Okay. So here was Daddy and Jack Allen. And back in those days, like nowadays, I see people roofing houses and they take these big things and plop the shingles up there. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Well, even though it wasn't that long ago, the trusses were just delivered. They were just laid out there in the yard. So here's Daddy and Jack Allen to attempt to get the trusses installed. A man showed up to help. We don't know. Daddy didn't know. The man left. We don't know who that man was. Now, some of you may know who it was. Please tell me. But we always feel that an angel came to help put the trust. And so never, ever underestimate the part that you may be playing as a human being in somebody else's answer to prayer. That may have been an angel. We think it was an angel, but it may not have been. It may have been someone passing by. Don't underestimate your value. So are there two children who would like to help me real quick hannah claire okay and are you briar or are you gunner briar okay y'all come up here and i want you to take this stack of papers and whoever on that side wants one let them have it and whoever on this side wants one let them have it so you know how your teacher passes so when you get your paper, I have a spot here for you to record five important things. I don't want you to forget about this day. Thank you, Briar and Hannah, for doing that. Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 through 32. 
what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. This is Jesus speaking. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even when the hairs on your head are all numbered, do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, pay special attention to this. Whoever acknowledges me, Matthew 10, verse 32, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Extraordinary people do extraordinary things. Even if they start messy, they just get started. During the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, held May through June that year, 1912, Jim Thorpe, a Native American from Oklahoma, represented the U.S. in track and field. And when I think about this, all sorts of questions come up in my mind and I wonder, well, where did he train? Was he just running out there on the fields in Oklahoma? And how did he compete to qualify for the Olympics? And I wonder, how in the world did a Native American from Oklahoma get to Sweden? Did he, how, how did he get the money? History tells us on the morning of his competition, his shoes were stolen. His shoes. Luckily, Jim ended up finding two shoes, guess where? <clears throat> in a garbage can. But one of the shoes was too big, so he had to wear an extra sock. Wearing these shoes, Jim won two gold medals that day. Two gold medals in mismatched shoes from the garbage and three socks. Was there fanfare? I don't know. I sort of think 1912, like, behind the times. And I don't know if he had family there cheering him on. Uh, there probably wasn't a sports psychologist there giving him pointers on how to win, even if he had on two different shoes. And I doubt there was a physiatrist there massaging his shoulders and all the reflex points in his feet to ensure the best edge in the field for winning. I don't think so. Now, I've really not read much about Jim Thorpe, though I did learn about him and all his amazingness as I was growing up. And I just have a feeling if I would take time to delve into his history, I would learn about an extraordinary man doing extraordinary things, even when it was messy. And that brings me to think about another extraordinary man, the psalmist. King, King David. We know he slayed lions with his hands and killed Goliath. He wrote this, Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. Think about that. The Lord hemming the King David in, behind and before. <coughs> You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? And where can I flee from your presence? 
If I go to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, you are there too. And if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day and the darkness is as light to you for you created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We can never, ever get away from the presence of the Lord. He is everywhere. Even if you're not living close to him, even if you have not committed your sins to him and turned toward him, he is there rooting for you. Now, what in the world does all this have to do with homecoming 2022, you know? the start messy stuff and the extraordinary people doing extraordinary things and God being everywhere and knowing all the things about me and you. He knows it all. The stuff you don't tell, the stuff you think is a secret, he knows it. So have, have you, what's, what's your favorite, your, your favorite dream vacation? Is it to go to Disney World or Hawaii or climb Mount Everest? Mm -mm. That one, I, I have no desire to climb Mount Everest. Just watching those YouTube videos of those little chain bridges spanning the abyss just shuts me down. But um, even if you experience those things that you would consider a once in a lifetime experience and it does bring you joy, then is your joy all wrapped up in that one experience? Or did you have joy and happiness before you experienced it? And Will you probably have joy and happiness after you experience it? Of course you will, because experts tell us that <clears throat> in the simple, small, daily habits, daily habits, simple daily habits, lived day in and day out, that brings us great joy. And depending on the habit across time, it can have extraordinary results. So years ago, in 1966, when Gordon and Ernestine Easley moved to Dyer, Arkansas, I know for a fact they did not have a spreadsheet with their 20-year plan. I even know they didn't have a spreadsheet of a 10-year plan or a 5-year plan. I know they didn't have a 3 months emergency fund set back for hard times. In fact, I'm pretty sure Daddy was out beating the bushes, as he'd say, looking for a job to pay rent and put food on the table. And as provision would have it, he began a remodel job across Mountainburg Valley for Mrs. Keys at Arkansas Traveler Antiques. And I don't know if that's still there. 
I was going to look yesterday, but we went on a different road. But there was an antique store at the bottom of when you come down from Winslow and get into the valley to start over toward Mountainburg School. So Mrs. Keys, she hired Daddy to remodel her antique store. Now, I've never seen such a, th I mean, I was two, so I'd never seen the things that she curated to sell, like, I don't know, maybe like East Lake and Chippendale and mixed in with lead crystal and Tiffany lamps. There was stuff everywhere. It was a perfect example of my mother saying, Rachel, don't you touch a thing. Her place was burgeoning with historical artifacts facts and in the big middle was a grand circular staircase and Mrs. Keys. And she smoked a cigarette all the time and she cussed a lot. And all of this made a big, big impression in my little toddler mind because by the time I was born, my, my dad didn't smoke anymore and he didn't cuss. And so that was unusual to me. And our object, our, our antiques were not objects of display, but they were actually stuff we used. And Daddy met Mr. Sims, the painter. Mr. Sims and his family lived out there in Turner. It was not a town, but a location that was not defined by lines of territory but more by a large community of local people who stood together through thick and thin. And so that's the short form story of how mother and daddy ended up coming from Dyer to Turner, somewhere in the middle of nowhere between Mountainburg and Mulberry, Dyer and the National Forest. Mother was 51 and daddy was 53. I've spoken some and written about living in Dyer on Georgia Ridge at the Bruce Place in the White House and the little house in the curve for church in the winter and the brush arbor that daddy and my brothers built for church in the summer. And you know, that's where the messy story started, but I'm gonna skip to Turner where they loved and longed to acknowledge Jesus Christ to others in this obedience he would acknowledge them to, their, to his heavenly father, to their heavenly father. If daddy didn't have a carpentry job to go to that day, once my older siblings left for school, mother, daddy, and I would get in the 1962 Bel Air Chevy, sky blue, and off we'd go, looking for a place to live and a place to have church. And we drove and drove on those rocky, dirt country roads. These used to be rocky dirt roads. <laughs> I'll never forget Daddy easing the car over the big boulders so the chassis wouldn't hang on the rocks and the trees wrapping the road with a dark tunnel of branches. I was usually scared and generally fearful that we were lost. But in her sweet and calm way, Mother would gently reassure me, Rachel, Daddy always always knows the way home, and in fact, he did. So eventually we found the old-fashioned house in the valley to rent and bought the 11-acre ridge of rocks and briars up on the hill across the road from the Sims family. And the roots of the Easley family began to grow deep into the red clay soil of Turner community. I remember when we talked about moving up on the hill and building a new house up there. Why, Mother, why? I love the old-fashioned house. With the creek and the barn, well, Rachel, we just feel like that place will eventually be better suited for our family. And so they started Massey with a vision and a dream and a lot of work ethic with very little money and none at times and great big faith and trust in an almighty God undergirded with prayer and absolute obedience. Now I mentioned the old fashioned house and that's where we rented while my parents built the house that Pally and Daryl bought. Uh, 
I grew up in that house. But the old fashioned house is Bob and R.C. Watkins house, if you know where that is, down in that valley over there. But it's still the old fashioned house to me. <laughs> So off the main road and around the bend about a mile or so, Daddy came across an old clapboard wood frame building, Turner Community Building, and appeared to be vacant. There was very little paint on the outside and many of the windows were broken out. And it must surely have electricity because light bulbs dangled from a black wire in three or four places in the ceiling. By inquiring around, Daddy learned that it was an old one-room schoolhouse and it was used for community funerals, the annual pie supper in November, and the dispersion of candy sacks on Christmas Eve when Santa came to visit. Living on the lane behind the building was Mentha Smith, who was on the board of trustees. Well, she wasn't sure about that, letting someone use it regularly she'd need to talk to the board. Mother and Daddy were excited to think of having a place to hold services and they anxiously awaited the board's decision. And after several days or a month after the board had had time to meet, we received word that if we were willing to share when they needed it for con community functions, then yes, in fact, we could rent Turner Community Building for church. How in the world did they let us know? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if they mailed Daddy a letter. I don't know if Mother and Daddy stopped back by Mentha Smith's house after the designated time. I don't, I don't know. Because we didn't have a phone, and it's likely she didn't either. So with a dream and a vision to acknowledge Christ to the people in Turner community, in the fall of 1968, Gordon and Ernestine Easley started Messy with inadequate means, humanly speaking, and began having church services in Turner Community Building. All seven of us. Mother, Daddy, Ray, Paul, Esther, David, and me. Because Carlton, Donnie, Pally, and Linda were all married, and Keith had just left for college. So every Sunday morning at 10, every Sunday night at 7, and every Wednesday night at 7.30, we went to the community building and had church. Daddy directed church from the platform and mother directed church from the pew. <laughs> My brother David was the song leader that I remember the most. He was seven years older than me and when he left to go to college then it was my turn to start leading song, song leading. And I was in the fifth grade. So I was behind that podium <laughs> and leading singing and mother would sit probably right about where Joanna is and she would sense if more people were coming in and she'd say sing one more song <laughs> or she'd say sing two more verses <laughs> and so you know on the fly here I'm picking out another song or deciding which verses to repeat but she directed from the pew. In fact, she would let Daddy know that it was time to wrap it up. <laughs> so, that it was, it was it, come on, it's time to go. A favorite chorus we sang many, many, many times was, the Lord knows the way through the wilderness. Do y'all know that song? It's a little tune. I think we should sing it. So let's we'll see. Who can pitch it in the right key? It's the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. 
Strength for today is mine all the way. So why should I worry about tomorrow? The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. And all I have to do is fall. Now I thought that was just a nice, sweet little tune to sing you know, to kind of wrap up the service. And it was usually our family singing it. But as an adult now, and carrying my own burdens, and dealing with unknown outcomes, unknown circumstances, I realized that time and time and time again, mother and daddy were affirming their faith and trust in an almighty sovereign God who promised to never abandon them. And in turn, they were modeling that for us. By winter, along with the accordion for Esther to play and the box of songbooks for singing, it was also necessary to carry a stack of firewood, kindling, paper, and matches to start the fire in the old tin stove. It wasn't pot belly, it was tin. That stove would get so hot that it glowed red orange during the service. If we would have tripped and fallen against it, we would have been sued nowadays. So we sat there in the chill of the old building and we could see steam rise from our mouth as we sang and talked. The old slatted wood benches were dragged across the wood floor to surround the stove and arranged in a square so we could keep warm. And mother would bring coats, I mean blankets. No, we didn't take our coats off. We kept our coats on. And mother would bring quilts and blankets to lay on the benches to attempt to hold the heat in from the rest of the building. In the winter, Sunday evening service was a bit more comfortable because of the fire from the morning smoldering through the day. And somewhere in there, we bought an old upright piano that we pushed against the southeast corner of the building. I felt sorry for Esther playing it because when she played the accordion, she could sit there by the fire. But when she had to sit over there in that corner away from the fire, she was cold and I was sad. It was customary and necessary as a small child to fall asleep on mother's lap and awaken just as the service ended. One particular winter night, I awakened to quite a commotion as my brothers were trying to catch a little, little tiny barn owl that had flown in and roosted right up there in the northwest corner of the ceiling. I'm sure it was much warmer there. In summer, in an attempt to squelch the heat, the windows that weren't broken were propped open with a piece of wood and all the doors were opened. We brought a box fan from home and it was strategically placed on the floor toward the platform in hopes of pulling a draft across the floor. Dogs would meander through the open door, sand in the sanctuary, and look around. And much to my delight, I loved it when dogs came through and daddy, it was consternation to him. Get out of here, he'd say, and clap his hands. It was another wonderful perk of summer to be able to sit outside for Sunday school on those tall front steps because it was much cooler out there. We could catch a breeze as opposed to sitting in the dim room made from the musty green curtains that enclosed the stage. And if you were fortunate enough to have the urge to go, it was a nice reprieve to squat behind the building after making sure no cars were passing, of course. During the summer between fourth and fifth grade, Daddy, Esther, David, and Paul were away for about six weeks that summer working on a job, and they took our only car. Each Sunday morning, Mother and I would leave the house carrying the box of songbooks and walk to church. Since neither Mother nor I played the accordion, we left that at home. When the box of books got too heavy, we'd take turns carrying them. One Sunday morning, 
as we rounded the curve at the bottom of our hill to start that trek across the valley toward R.C. and Bob Watkins' house, you know, the old-fashioned house, Davy Watkins was leaving his house. I'll never forget, as he pulled out of his driveway there across the creek, he leaned out his window and he said, Ms. Easley, where are y'all headed? And she told Davy that Daddy and the others were gone. And since we just had one car and they had it, we were walking to church. He asked us if we'd like a ride. He didn't mind dropping us over there at the community building. And Mother graciously accepted his generous offer. And from that time till now, I have never forgotten how the ride from Davy Watkins encouraged us that summer Sunday morning. Mother and Daddy were so faithful, and I never saw them be resentful of the circumstances because they were acknowledging to men and lifting up Jesus Christ. In turn, Jesus Christ was lifting them up to the Heavenly Father. I, on the other hand, sometimes just wanted to go to a real church. I mean whatever a real church was, I just didn't think that this could possibly be it. Mr. Myris, the beloved milkman and bus driver, was the first person to pray to be saved in the services at the community building. And in a subsequent service, while the congregation was singing the gospel tune, there's a new name written down in glory. Mr. Myris raised his hand and a silent testimony to that truth in his life. And a few weeks later, he passed away suddenly. I remember his funeral. We shared the community building and the locals packed out in honor of his life and memory. Esther and David met Diana and Arlene on the school bus and invited them to church. So they started walking to church faithfully every Sunday. And if we would meet them along the way, we would pick them up and give them a ride on to church and then back home. At least that's the way I remember it. You might have a different memory, Diane. Diana. I remember the Sunday that Diana prayed to be saved, the first in her family. Arlene continued to come with her, and a few months later, she was saved. And when Arlene passed away, I looked in Mother's little notebook, and sure enough, Mother had recorded. <laughs> recorded it in that book. The records are there. But just the value of committing a life to Christ recorded. What a wonderful testimony as gradually all the Riggs family came to church and professed their faith in Christ. But Diana, Arlene, Esther, and I were the youth group, the Sunday school teachers, the VBS planners, the Christmas Eve program planners, and performers, the child care workers, the Easter egg hunt planners, and you name it, we did it. Remember, Diana? <sighs> we ran in a pack. And I know if Esther were here, her eyes would be brimming with tears and she would be shaking her head, yes. Diana, Arlene, and I were all baptized together in the icy cold spring-fed creek down by the S-curve on a blistering hot July Sunday afternoon. So the days turned to months and months turned to years and seasons changed and life continued on and the Easley family grew roots. The messy start was taking hold and the dream was becoming reality and the Easleys grew to love the people of Turner. The Watkins and Smiths, Sims, Taylors, Adams, Shores, Wilkinson, Myrises, Claytons, Pattersons, McDonners, Pixleys, Bakers, Jones, Allens, Holtz, Riggs, Adcocks, Friars, Archers, Huggins, the list goes on and on. And I'm sure I've left important people out, but not because I meant to. And roots grew deep, and the love for the family of Turner grew deeper. 
Family friends who lived in Indiana purchased this property and donated it to the church. One by one, we all left home, and Philip and I were married in the summer of 1985. By that fall, you were holding services here. I witnessed the groundbreaking and the dreams and pouring the foundation, putting up the walls, drywall, the ceiling, the lights, the rafters that I mentioned. But I never had the opportunity to regularly worship in this beautiful facility, so my memories do consist of the choice my parents made to come to Turner and of growing the church attendance in the community building in a dream and a call without having it all figured out. But faith, trust, absolute obedience undergirded with prayer. They didn't have it all figured out. They just got started. They started messy, and they got rooted and grounded in following God without abandon. When our son Daniel was born July 8, 1992, mother and daddy came to Indiana to be with us, and it was evident that mother was very ill. Within days of his birth, she was in ICU, comatose, and we were grasping at straws to learn what was wrong. A 35-day hospital stay turned into three weeks in rehab and an unexpected nine-month vacation in Greenfield, Indiana. But the story of the messy start and the dream and the vision of Ozark View Chapel could have ended right there, right there. Done. Stick a fork in it. Put a nail in the coffin. It's older. It's over. Mrs. Easley, she's, she's seizing. She's comatose. She doesn't know us. But mother and daddy didn't freak out. I never saw them freak out about anything. Not even that. Daddy always prayed and knew that prayer made a difference. And mother would always say, though she couldn't be in comatose, well, it's all going to work out some way. Some way it'll all work out. Pally and Daryl were in transition between churches, and they graciously agreed to come here just to help out, you know, temporary, until something else opens up. And temporary is turned in 30 years this August, and what an absolute magnificent job they've done. Those of you who started attending under their ministry can share all of the wonderful things. You can testify to acknowledging Jesus Christ before men in your obedience, and he is acknowledging you to your heavenly Father. What wonderful leaders Pally and Daryl have been in a temporary situation that they didn't particularly choose. But God chose them because they were willing to do his work and they were willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ to the community. You all know this 30 year history. I've, I was removed from it. I was taken out of it. But you've lived every single piece of the growth. You've seen firsthand God's faithfulness in the highs and the lows. And I know that you could go on for hours and hours and hours telling stories and memories. And this is homecoming 2022. And, and we should re reminisce. We should tell those stories. We should recount the blessings. But I must remind you that we cannot sit on the planks of history and lord her there hoping, hoping that that old tapestry that I've described is going to come to life for you today. No. Galatians 6, 9 implores us to not become discouraged in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not faint. 
And today, this is our moment, our only opportunity today to weave into that tapestry, that glorious, glorious tapestry of God's handiwork. And Philippians 1.9 states, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's not us bringing it to completion. No, that's Jesus Christ bringing it to completion. Look, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he who began the good work will bring it to completion. The weight rolls off. It's not up to us, it's up to him. We just have to stay in our lane. We just have to stay focused and keep making the next best choice, even if it feels messy with sheer faith, sheer trust, absolute obedience undergirded with prayer. So what's all this got to do with ordinary people doing extraordinary things? Well, it's about you and it's about me and it's about our time because we're living and breathing right now. But you say, I'm not extraordinary. I don't know what to do. Okay, maybe you don't have a dream to go evangelize Turner community like my parents did. Maybe you don't have a dream or a call to go to a mission field or pastor a church somewhere. You may not even feel called to stand up here and sing beautifully like Kathy does. But you know what? In the sheer, quiet promptings of your heart, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 27, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim to the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but rather the ones who kill the soul. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Because whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So in your quiet promptings, when you have the eyes of your heart open to your heavenly Father, he is speaking to you. He is everywhere. You are never lost to him. And he's telling each of us to do something, to do his work, to fulfill his plan. So, the five things that I want you to write on your paper. The key to an extraordinary life. Philip's going to help me with this because I'm shaky. And y'all don't want what's in this right here on your card. I'll just tell you that right now. So Philip's going to help me. So, you feel ordinary. Is this ordinary? Probably everybody has this in their cabinet, huh? Yep, vegetable oil. Vegetable oil. Okay, there's that. Yeah, put that in here. And I'm gonna let you do that. <laughs> this goblet represents you, you, me, you, every one of us. That's this goblet. We are the vessels. And this vegetable oil, this plain old vegetable oil, represents prayer. And so how many times have you said, well, I don't know what else to do but pray? Well, absolutely pray. That's our greatest asset, our greatest weapon. Our undergirding is prayer. And then we have trust. And sometimes, and you probably all have one of these in your car, don't you? Just plain old ordinary water. But that's just plain old trust right there. And, and you know, Sometimes our trust feels kind of weak and wobbly and shaky, doesn't it? But trust. Trust. Is it hard to trust? 
I think sometimes it's hard to trust. Because we get caught up in our anxiety, we get caught up in our fear, and we start focusing on that. And, and pretty soon we're like, wait, I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to be trusting. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to trust. And then we have, you know what this is? Just plain old food coloring. Food coloring. And that's faith. Because I've been blessed time and time again by the fact that the scripture says if we have the faith of a mustard seed, a mustard seed, size of faith. Thank goodness he didn't say if you have a truckload of faith. Thank goodness he didn't say if you have a dump truck of faith. Thank goodness he said, thank you, Lord, he said, if you just have a mustard seed of faith, you can say from this mountain move here to move there. Do I understand that? No, I don't, but God said it. So I'm going to live in faith. Now, to be right honest, I have no idea if this is going to work the way I want it to. <laughs> but it better by God's blessing. So on your paper, you is number one. Thank you, Philip. To live an extraordinary life, you just have to be you. And the second one is trust and the third one is faith and the fourth one is prayer so you can pray yeah you can pray pray all you want pray all you want I don't care the Bible says pray without ceasing go forth and pray or let's we'll say trust trust Oh, I'm trusting that this works out. I'm trusting that we have money to, to put the rafters on. I'm, I'm trusting, I'm trusting, I'm trusting. Or, I have faith that you can be healed. I've got faith for that. So as a Christian, we can pray, and we can have faith, and we can have trust. Those are all good, aren't they? But you know when the extraordinary happens? You know what makes living a Christian life, what makes you extraordinary and do extraordinary things is when you take prayer and faith and trust That's the fourth. and you undergird it with what? Absolute obedience. Absolute obedience to what God says. That's when things happen. You can pray. And God might be telling you to do whatever it is you're praying about. And you can have faith and trust. And God may be telling you what to do to see the outcome of that trust and faith. But guess what? Nothing's going to happen if you're disobedient. It will only happen if you're obedient. Prayer, you can do that. Trust, you can do that. Faith, you can do that. I'm a Christian. I have faith. I have trust. I'm a Christian. I pray. But are you a Christian that lives in absolute obedience? That's where the extraordinary comes in. Do I have it all figured out? No, I don't. I just have models that lived it before me, that set the example before me, my parents, my siblings, this church, you're all living it out to become extraordinary examples. And I want to encourage you and encourage myself what is God saying in the small, quiet whispers of my heart and of your heart to obey? That's when you'll see extraordinary people.
do extraordinary things. So I pray that you feel God's blessing and that you feel God's presence. And I pray that you can always remember if this day you need to recommit your life to Christ, you can recommit. If there's hidden sins that bind you and hold you down, confess those again. God is a faithful Heavenly Father, and we can keep coming back to Him just like I could keep going back to Daddy and say, peel me another apple or pick me up and carry me. I'm, he I'm, I'm tired. We can just keep going back to our Heavenly Father. But He may be asking you to obey because you may be on the verge of something really, really extraordinary because you're extraordinary. Thank you. 58 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no.